Hello and welcome to my video log on skills versus capacities in the weight room. I believe one of our roles as coaches is to help athletes learn the skills to display their physical capacities in the most optimal manner. In this video I will explain some of my coaching processes. First up we have Avi. His main area for improvement is to improve his range of motion and achieve full depth. When squatting challenging loads he reverts to a half squat technique with his knees reaching 90 degrees. My first step was to reduce the load, instruct him to squat deeper, use a progressively lower box as an external cue to encourage depth and provide a close spot to increase his perception of safety. This resulted in a parallel squat but with pronounced hip flexion and forward trunk lean and a bar that loops forward during the concentric phase. When we attempted to increase the load he would revert to his previous technique due to an actual or perceived inability to squat deeper. The most efficient way to squat a bar is in a straight line in balance with the midfoot. When the bar travels forward, this increases the moment arm between the bar and the body's center of mass, increasing the force required to overcome the mass of the barbell against gravity. This will limit the lifter's ability to express strength and create a potential mechanism for injury. I then assessed Avi's hip, knee and ankle range of motion. How et al demonstrated how mobility at one joint can influence higher or lower in the kinetic chain. Avi had no obvious joint restrictions or imbalances. Avi has proportionally long legs and thighs. He is 6 foot 3 or 191 centimetres tall with a higher than average leg to body ratio of 0.55 and tibia to femur ratio of 0.87. His body type is not ideal for squatting as he has to squat with greater hip flexion and torso lean in order to maintain the centre of mass of the bar and his body in line with his midfoot. However, Avi exhibits excessive forward lean as the bar is anterior to his midfoot. This begs the question, why doesn't he adopt a slightly more upright technique to maintain a more balanced and direct bar path? I believe the answer to this is that he has a capacity issue in quadriceps strength. When a lifter squats more upright, this will result in less hip flexion contribution from the powerful adductor magnus and gluteal muscles, so knee extension will make up a greater contribution to the lift. We can instruct athletes to adopt different techniques, but when challenged, the central nervous system will coordinate the neuromuscular system in the way that is perceived to be optimal to complete the movement task efficiently. Avi has good hip extension strength, so when dropping into a moderate load squat, his central nervous system self-organizes a more flexed hip angle, even though this results in the inefficiency of a forward bar path, because this is perceived to be stronger or more energy efficient than remaining more upright and relying on his quadriceps. When the load is too high, the central nervous system perceives that he will not have the strength to overcome the forward trunk lean and blocks him from going deeper. Avi is less strong during deep knee flexion, even with exercises that reduce the need for balance such as leg press. To further test this hypothesis, I asked Avi to squat wearing knee wraps, which provide elastic support to the knee joint and create the effect of stronger knee extensors. This promoted a more upright torso and improved bar path. This indicates that improving Avi's quadriceps strength capacity will lead to improvements in technique. To improve Avi's knee extension strength capacity, I have programmed leg presses with a deep range of motion and quad dominant stance, and front squats to provide the affordances to utilise this capacity and promote a deeper and more upright squat. Next up is Edward. During his squat, his pelvis is tucking under his body into a posterior pelvic tilt and pulling the lumbar spine into flexion. This could be improved by holding his lower back tighter at the bottom of the lift. There is also a slight forward bar path during the concentric phase and his weight appears to be on his forefoot. I want to briefly discuss whether spinal flexion should be avoided while squatting. We should expect about 6 to 25 degrees of flexion during the squat, with the first 10 degrees occurring within the neutral zone. Some research does not support a correlation between lumbar flexion and lower back pain. However, a neutral and stable spine is a less clear mechanism for injury and will enhance performance. Since experienced medical professionals have been shown to miss spinal flexion in up to 37% of cases, it is possible that what we perceive as a neutral spine has some flexion and what we perceive as a flex spine has more flexion than we can see. Overall, I believe some lumbar flexion may be fine for some lifters, but for others it may lead to injury. So for this reason, I prioritised correcting Edward's hip tuck. Assessing Edward's posture and mobility, he exhibits signs of lower cross syndrome, deficits in hip internal rotation and ankle dorsiflexion, and tight hip flexors, especially his rectus femoris. I was mindful of this as I attempted to adjust his technique to see if he could safely borrow a range of motion from other joints to squat well. 
My first step was to lend him my squat shoes with a raised heel, show his squat videos, pointing out where he could improve, and instruct him to keep his rib cage stacked and pulled down on top of his pelvis. We also performed some planks and bird dogs as part of his warm up to activate the core muscles and practice lumbo pelvic hip alignment. As you can see, Edward needed some cueing to reach a good stable alignment. This didn't immediately correct Edward's hip tuck. I believe I made his focus too internal and cognitive, thinking about his positioning of a specific body part instead of the global execution of the skill. Athlete's technique is heavily influenced by their movement history. If Edward is used to squatting a specific way, this will be his default unless an appropriate intervention is made. So the next session, I tried a constraints-based approach where I got him to warm up with a box squat, which produced an immediate improvement in hip tuck, even when the box was removed. On some reps, there is some forward bar path, but this takes time to perfect, so I am confident we can improve this over time. This indicates that Edward's hip tuck was mainly due to a skill issue, although his mobility may have been a factor. It also reminded me of the importance in recognising where when my interventions aren't effective and trying different approaches based on the individual athlete. Here is JJ performing an overhead press for upper body strength and to maintain or hopefully build some muscle mass during a fat loss phase. His technique is not terrible, but it has some inefficiencies. He is starting the lift with his elbows behind his wrists. This means his forearms are pointed forwards. This increases the moment arm between the barbell and the elbow and shoulders. It also means he is working against the barbell, pulling his shoulders into internal rotation, whereas if his forearms are vertical, this would not be the case. With pushing exercises, the load tends to follow the directions that the forearms are pointed in. After commencing the lift, this is what happens. The bar travels slightly forward and it then needs to travel backwards to finish in balance above the shoulder and midfoot. On some reps, the momentum of the bar travelling backwards carries it behind the finish point. When starting overhead movements, I ask clients to test their shoulder flexion, internal and external rotation to rule out mobility restrictions. Since JJ has good shoulder mobility and has only recently learned to overhead press, it's highly likely that inefficiencies in technique are due to skill issues. JJ has made good progress over the past few months, but will need to correct these errors if he wants to continue to make progress and fulfill his potential in this exercise. My first step is to send him a video of him lifting with a voiceover explaining how I would like him to improve his technique and why. The main cues would be to move from the correct start to finish position from A to B in a straight line, close to the face and push the body through as soon as the bar has cleared the forehead. I got him to reduce his training load by 10 to 15 kilograms and work his way back up in 2.5 kilogram increments each week so he can practice and refine the intended movement pattern. It's very difficult for athletes to change when they're pushing close to their limit. Intermuscular coordination is trained best with loads of 40 to 70% of one rep max. I asked him to record videos of him performing the overhead press so I can give him feedback as we've been focusing on other lifts during our one-to-one -one sessions. We could incorporate overhead presses with pauses or slow tempos to reinforce the movement pattern and encourage his central nervous system to employ the most efficient technique. Finally, I've chosen myself for the overhead press because there is a clear and obvious capacity issue to talk about. Pressing occasionally provokes mild shoulder impingement and sacroiliac joint irritation. There are two main technical errors, an overextended lumbar spine and anterior pelvic tilt. Potential mechanisms for injury as every two degrees in overextension increases posterior disc compression by 10%. A soft lockout. The shoulders and elbows are not fully flexed or extended and the position can't be held without difficulty when it should be a position of balance and an opportunity to train rotator cuff stability. This is likely limiting performance because it is the second sticking point of the lift. Assessing static posture, there are signs of upper and lower cross syndrome and wing scapulae. There are deficits in shoulder flexion, worse of a posteriorly tilted pelvis. This indicates that latissimus dorsi is primarily responsible for the restriction and internal and external rotation. Lumbar flexion is limited but adequate for overhead press. The hip flexors are tight, especially the rectus femoris. It's clear that the technical errors are due to mobility capacity issues. I believe the main culprit is an overactive latissimus dorsi. Over time, lifters will adapt to achieve their movement goals within the constraints of their capacities. The whole body is an interconnected system and what occurs at the shoulder is affecting the lumbar pelvic hip complex and vice versa. The movement strategy of anterior pelvic tilt and lumbar overextension is an attempt to gain more lat range of motion at the glenohumeral joint. The lats are polyarticular muscles originating on the posterior iliac crest and lumbar spine via the forica lumbar fascia, among others. When these origins are brought closer to the attachment, they create more range of motion. Even with this compensation, there is still a deficit in lat range of motion which must be resisted at the lock. Out. The lats are internal rotators, so when tense, it can pull the shoulder into internal rotation, which reduces the subacromial space and leads to impingement syndrome. It's likely there are also issues with scapular protraction and upward rotation, but I focus my intervention on the lats. 
I followed the NASM corrective exercise continuum which has been shown to lead to improvements in spinal overextension. The inhibit phase involved foam rolling of the lats. Retesting shoulder flexion showed improvements. The lengthen phase involved static stretching of the shoulder. Retesting mobility showed further improvements. The activate phase incorporated the trap free raise and the integrate phase returned to overhead pressing. There were little visual improvements, but the lockout phase felt slightly smoother. This is likely due to the technique and posture being very ingrained, and this will be a long-term fix, but the improvements in flexion retesting indicate that we are on the right track.